וגם אני פתאום רואה את הקולות. Hello and welcome to Kolot. This is your host, Rabbi Hillel Kappenstein, Director of the Columbus Community Kolel, and it's a great honor and privilege to welcome you to our next episode featuring Rabbi Herschel Schechter, the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak Elchanan, otherwise known as Ritz. It's a great zechus that we get to have the Rosh Hashiva join us on this program. We're going to entitle it, Ask the Rabbi, as that is exactly what we do on so many different topics. Um, this episode is sponsored by Rick and Terry Barnett of Remax Main Street. So thank you, Rick and Terry, for sponsoring this. And I will be co-hosted by Rabbi Ari Newman, a friend, a colleague, an associate. He is the associate rabbi at the Main Street Synagogue, Congregation Torah Met, and also a student of Rabbi Schechter and uh, Yeshiva University. So this is a great um, opportunity that a former student and uh, graduate gets to talk to his rabbi on this show and ask such um, incredible questions on so many different areas of uh, Judaism. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to cover a lot of different topics. I'll tell you a few of them right now. Um, one of them is what uh, Rabbi Schachter learned from his rebellion, who they were and what did he learn from them. Uh, some other things that he um, that we discuss is the need for more rebellion in, you know, in our all of our schools around the country. Uh, maybe some differences between different Jewish communities and not so significant differences between Jewish communities. Uh, we also cover some controversial halachic uh, topics that we're going to uh, get to and the different opinions and when one could rely on uh, which opinion. Is one allowed to go heter shopping for rabbis who are more lenient? Is one allowed? Um, are there times where it's allowed? How does that work? And we also talk a little bit about how do you talk about Mashiach, which is also something, uh, a fascinating discussion. So we're going to cover all of this right on this show. Um, following this episode, we're going to show you, uh, we're going to replay a music video of Lule Sayrascha, um, which is a, a beautiful music video that we put out right in the uh, heat of COVID, right, you know, you know, during the intense lockdowns um, about our relationship with Torah learning. And we thought it would be so appropriate to show that video following our interview with such a Tamar Chacham, with such a, um, such a big uh, Torah scholar as well. So following this episode, don't turn off your computer, your phone, or whatever you're watching this on. Uh, make sure to watch that beautiful music video as well. And uh, without further ado, please allow me to tell you about our guest. <laughs> Rabbi Herschel Schechter is a noted Talmudic scholar and has had a distinguished career with REITs for over 50 years. He joined the faculty in 1967 at the age of 26, the youngest Rosh Hashiva at REITs. Since 1971, Rabbi Schechter has been Rosh Kolo and in REITs Institute for Advanced Research in Rabbinics. In addition to his teaching duties, Rabbi Schechter lectures, writes, and serves as a world-renowned halachist. A prolific author, he has written more than a hundred articles in Hebrew and in English for such scholarly publications as Hapardes, Hoadarom, Beth Yitzchak, and Or Hamizrach. His svarim include Eretz Hatzvi, Beikve Hatzon, Ginas Haegos, and Nefesh Harav, Bipni Harav, and Divre Harav. At the age of 22, Rabbi Schechter was appointed assistant to the renowned Rabbi Joseph B. Salavechik Zatzal. Rabbi Schechter has also graduated from the Bernard Revel Graduate School with a BA in Hebrew Literature and was ordained that same year. Alongside myself, I have a dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Newman, who I believe, Rabbi Newman, you have a, you, you have a relationship with Rosh Hashiva, is that right? Yeah, actually, um, so the Rosh Hashiva is, uh, is his son-in-law, um, Rav Tani Kohn, is the assistant rabbi in my in-laws shul, the Prales. Mm -hmm. And I was <clears throat> privileged uh, one, one Sukkot that there was a little bit of overflow at, uh, I think your, your daughter Yaffa's house that, uh, that Rav Schechter came and joined us at, um, at the Prales house. And 
I think uh, we bunked up in the in the sukkah, that uh, particular sukkot. Um, I think my mother-in-law offered you a a, a cot, and we uh, we both ended up uh, sleeping in the sukkah that night. Um, also, I was uh, I merited to go to Germany with you, Rabbi Sobolowski, and a couple of other students from YU. Um, and it was actually my first trip to the yeshiva in Berlin, which I went to two subsequent times afterwards. Um, and it was uh, I, I still remember waking up early, learning. Um, Masachat Tzimura with you. Um, it was the first time I'd ever dabbled in that, but it was uh, some fun times. So, um, wow. So, th- th- thank you that thank you for that, Rabbi Newman, and thank you so much, uh, Rosh Hashiva, for coming on. Um, wanted to first ask the Rosh Hashiva if you could tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your background, where you learned some of your rebbeim, and some of the things of the, some of the uh, guiding forces that uh, were, I guess, from childhood and beyond. Uh, my father was a rabbi all of his life. He was also a Muslim from Yeshiva College at that time. He learned by Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik. And his first rabbinical position was in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I was born there. Then my father was rabbi in Reading, then in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, I went to the day school, uh, which only went to the fifth grade. And then uh, my parents had to send me to New York to stay with my grandparents in order to go to the day school in New York for sixth grade. And then before my bar mitzvah, my parents already moved to New York. So then after bar mitzvah, I attended Yeshiva University High School and I'm still there. I'm still there in Yeshiva University all these years since my bar mitzvah. (laughs) Who are my rabbeim? Uh, I only had, I had very few rabbeim. In high school I had three rabbeim and then the third rebbe in the third year high school recommended that for the fourth year high school at the age of 16, they should put me in Rabbi Soloveitchik's class. But because I was so young, Rabbi Soloveitchik only gave a shir at that time on Tuesday and Wednesday. He would come in from Boston on Tuesday morning, give a shir on Tuesday, a shir on Wednesday, then go back. So because I was so young, so I thought I should be in Rabbi Soloveitchik's shir for Tuesday and Wednesday, and the rest of the week, all the rabbi was learning the same Gemara, the rest of the week I should be in Rabbi Gorelik's shir. So all of my rabbeim had a tremendous influence on me. My main rabbi was Rabbi Soloveitchik for 10 years, to the age of 16 and 26. And then before that, I learned the first year of high school, I learned in Rabbi Moshe David Tendler's class. He just passed away a few months ago. Then the second year I learned by Rabbi Yosef Weiss, who just passed away a few years ago, about three years ago. Then the third year I learned <coughs> by a European, Talmud Chacham, Rabbi Henoch Fishman, who was a, a very beloved Talmud of Rabbi Abdelbala Soloveitchik, Shiva University, we had a few rabbeim who had learned in Europe by Rabbi Abdelbala. So Rabbi Fishman was one of them. And then the fourth year I learned by Rabbi Gorelik, who also learned by Rabbi Abdelbala Soloveitchik. And, uh, and at the same time, I was in Rabbi Soloveitchik Shia. I was very fortunate. Um, I was there to learn 10 years by Rabbi Salvei. I think those were the best 10 years of his, uh, of his life. Before my time, there were a lot of brilliant students, more brilliant than me, but I don't know. I think Rabbi Salvei, Chik Shurim, probably too, too difficult for them. So they can't say over anything. And, um, and after I left this year, Rabbi Salvei, Chik was already was not healthy. He had Parkinson's and he couldn't prepare for this year. He was already old. I think I had the best 10 years of his life and of his career of giving shiur. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful. And one last question before I turn it over to uh, Rabbi Newman. Um, I was told by uh, another friend here in Columbus, Rabbi David Clayman, who's uh, Rabbi Willig's uh, son-in-law. And I told him that we were having this interview and he said, oh, you have to ask the shiva for stories about Gedalim. He has the best stories. You have to make sure. So I don't know if you have a favorite Gadol story or, or something that you like to share with people, but I definitely wanted to make sure that we covered that. So if there's something you could share, please do. I, uh, over the years, I met different Tamir uh, HaChamim of the earlier generation. A favorite story. I don't know. I have a lot of stories. I remember uh, my father-in-law, Zachan Levracha, was a teenager in Europe when he learned to marry yeshiva. And he became very, very befriended. He became very friendly with Rabbeinu Finkel. <clears throat> so years later, 
after Abanish passed away and his son-in-law, Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel was the Rosh Hashiva, he was very friendly with me because he, his father-in-law and my father-in-law were the best of friends. So I remember the first time we visited, I was married for a while, we didn't have any children, so we decided to go visit her. So the Gemara says sometimes you don't have children because it's Gorim, because you live in Chutzlor. So sometime we decided maybe we'll visit there. So maybe in the schus of visiting, maybe we'll be blessed with children. And then when we came back, we had nine children. And now we have many grandchildren. <clears throat> so I remember the first, the first summer we visited Eretz Yisrael. Rabbeinu Shvinkel wanted we should spend, we should eat all the meals by him. He was so friendly with my father-in-law. He felt that I should eat all the meals by him. So I remember uh, we ate, we didn't eat all the meals by him. But we ate by him more than anybody else because he insisted. So I remember once on a Shabbos afternoon, we came a little late to Shalosh Shudas and he had already washed it. He already said, Hamoitzi. So I was going to say, my own Hamoitzi. So there were gigantic chalas on the table. So as I was washing in the kitchen, the Danish was a big tzanua. He, he, he had a lot of midas chasidis, but uh, even his own children didn't even realize he only had daughters. Even his own children didn't realize his midas chasidus. So he whispered to me in my ear, he's always mocked it to cut both chalas, and I shouldn't feel uncomfortable, even though the chalas are gigantic, I should cut the both chalas for shalosh shudas. So, okay. Go in shita, the only go in paskins like the rash. Boy, I should cut both chalas. So I sat down at the table, I cut the both chalas. So he had a daughter. Uh, he had one single daughter at that time, the youngest daughter. She, she started screaming at me in Hebrew. Why do you cut the both chalas for? Nobody else is eating. Why do you ruin the shlemus? She was brought up for 18 years in her father's home. She never realized that the father's always machme, always medactic to cut the both chalas. He had, he had a lot of midas chasidis, and he was such a tzanua. His own family didn't realize what is, what is midas chasidis. Wow. I don't know. There are a lot of stories. A lot of stories about Rab Salavechik also, yeah. So uh, one of the things that for me is very inspiring is I know your father was a re- was the rabbi, your Rosh Hashiva. I know um, your son, Rosh Shai Shechter. Um, I was in YU with him. And as I mentioned, I know your daughter, Yaffa, Rabbi Sin Yaffa Kohn, who is also a Rabbi Sin. And look, me and Rabbi Kapitzin are both young parents. And we're, we, all, we all both have young children. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to raise them in the world today. And I was curious if, if, if Rav Shechter had any insight in terms of uh, some of the successes that you've, you and the Rebetzin have had. It's such a different world now. I don't know how I would be able to raise my children in this world. There's so many crazy things going on and you have to, you can't protect your children from these things. They're going to be exposed to them whether you like it or not. How do you deal with everything? I don't know. I think my children have a more difficult job raising their children than I had with my wife raising our children. I don't know. You have to have a big siyay tarishma. You have to daven a lot. You have to daven a lot to be matzliach. And what you have to do, I'm not sure. I don't know. Great. (laughs) Davening a lot is definitely not a bad start. So that's... uh... That, that's definitely one thing. Um, I, I was just wondering if the Rashiva could could elaborate. Is there something that maybe parents overlook? Um, because ultimately, we're not going to um, quote unquote win our children with um, with entertainment. The world out there is going to do a much better job at that. But sticking to parents, sticking to their strengths, maybe there's going to be something there that is better than entertainment. So, what, what would the Rashiva suggest in terms of parents that are looking to really make sure that they are the um, you know, primary source of influence. Um, what is something that the Rashiva could suggest to parents that they have children that you know, carry their values? The parents have to have, to have the Rashamayim and they have to impress upon their children how important the Rashamayim is. When we bench for Shchidosh, every month we bench for Shchidosh, so we say a text that the, it's not really the way it appears in the Gemara, the way we say the tefillah, Yerat Zemof Anecha, we mentioned twice in the same tefillah, Chaim Sheish Bam Yerashamayim. Apparently, over the generations, the Rabbanim decided that we needed an extra dose of Yerashamayim. So we mentioned it twice. 
Yerushalayim is very important. The children have to be taught how to read Hebrew and how to understand Hebrew. So they'll be able to learn everything from the original. They have to learn young. I remember when I was a young boy, I used to read different swarm that uh, were in my father's shul. Before my bar mitzvah, I used to read. I, I read Hebrew without Nakudas. I guess my father must have taught me. I don't know. I guess so. Um, so one other question. Um, I remember, and I'm not sure this is a new problem or an old problem or a perennial problem, but I remember when I went to JEC, many of my rebbeim were wonderful Tamni um, Chachamim, and they came in from Lakewood to teach um, in JEC. And it was a, generally a non-Orthodox school. A lot of the students ended up going to YU. And I know as being on the other end now um, in community leadership, we struggle very mightily trying to fill slots of Rebbeim in our school. I'm curious um, if you have any insight in terms of, um, do you think this is just going to be a problem? Is there a way to try to um, help help it? What do you, what do you what, well, I don't know if Rashiv has any thoughts. I remember many years ago, maybe 40 years ago, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein with many other, Rabbi Mendel Zaks, many other Rabbanim, must have been more than, must have been 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, the big Rosh Yeshiva in the United States signed a, a kol curry that was hanging in all the yeshivas, encouraging the young musmachim and the young graduates of the yeshivas to go into chinuch on, a, on an elementary age. Each one holds that he wants to be the head of a koil. He wants to have uh, college-age students. He wants to have adults. But we need people to teach the young children also. You need good people. We have to encourage them. Just this uh, two, uh, two days ago on, on Shabbos, we had Moish Bain, who was the president of the OU, of the National Organization OU. He was the guest in YU. Every Shabbos, they have someone else. So he was saying this is the biggest problem that the Orthodoxy have in America now. We're missing a lot of people in Chinuch who should teach, Rabbeim and administration, uh, principals. Out of town, there are a lot of places where they need. He said, in, uh, there's one yeshiva in town where they used to have 60 applicants for one job, for one teaching position. Now they have two applicants for the same position. Fewer people agree to go into Chinuch on, on a high school level. And lower than that, there's even fewer people. It's not a prisus covid The prima godim was a goin a goinim. And he taught mikri dardiki. He taught little children tanach. He has in his, in the beginning of the Sefer, Prima Godam on Arachayim, he has letters to other Mechanchim, what kind of a Tanakh you should teach from, and how to teach, uh, and how to pronounce the words, and so on, uh, elementary, basic things. He was a Mikri Dariki. But we, we need, uh, you have, if you'll have a Goenim like the Prima Godam teaching elementary school, then the children will learn well. The problem is that today, many of the Rabbeim who teach Chumash are wet behind the ears. They themselves don't know Pshat and Chumash. They teach us Cholos Gemara. They themselves don't know Gemara well. That's not well. That's not good. When I was young, my rabbi, I was fortunate in a sense. My rabbi were all refugees who ran away from uh, Europe during the war. They had learned in yeshivas all their lives. So they were teaching us Chumash and Rashi. They knew all the Rashis from the Gemara. They didn't in Rashi Alatar. They knew all the Gemaras with the Taisus and with the Pnei Yeshuas. And they were teaching us Chumash and Rashi, and they were teaching Haskolos Gemara. They knew all the Taisus and with all the Rishonim and all the Pnei Yeshuas. I was fortunate in that sense that I had big, big Tamir Chacham teaching me at a very young age. And uh, now, we don't, people, everybody wants to be on a higher level of education. Nobody wants to teach younger children. That's an Avla Gedolo. It's not right. The Rashiva just mentioned uh, Maish Bain, and he's actually on our list of future people. He doesn't know this yet, but he's going to Mirza Hashem come on soon. But uh, um, he has a lot to say. <laughs> right. So um, I actually recently learned that Maish Bain is a, is a mechutin with a very close friend and mentor of mine, um, Aaron Cutler, who um, was on a very um, was on a very popular podcast uh, behind the bima uh, from a, it was also a Talmud of the Rashiva, and he they asked. Um, Aaron Cutler was talking about his relationship with Mai Spain, and he said something very interesting. Um, he said that if people only really realize the achdus that exists um, on the leadership level, on the back end, 
um, between all the different yeshivas in the Lit Vishavelt, um, they would, you know, so much of this, you know, a, a lot of uh, the preconceived notions that people have about the division would, would, would fade away. And he brought a raya, as they say, that if you look in the halls of Beth Medrash Gavoa and the halls of, of Yeshiva's uh, Rabbeinu Yitzchak Kelchan, it's the same names, it's the same Gevirim, it's the same philanthropists. Um, my question to Yeshiva is, have you found the experience to be the same? That really there is a tremendous achtos amongst the leadership of the different Yeshivas in our world. I don't know the achtos among the leader. I don't know, but the difference in the students is not that great. They learn the same Svarim and all the Yeshivas and the same style of learning. Everything is very, very similar. The differences are uh, very insignificant. It's not Moshe just ben the donors. Yeah, Moish Bain mentioned that uh, just recently he davened in, a, in an Aguda minion and he looked around and he asked the one sitting next to him, what percentage of the people here send their children to college? They, they, he tells them 95% of them go to college. So what's the difference between them and the modern Orthodox? <laughs> they learned Afyami, they learned Afyami. It's not the same. The difference is very insignificant. Right, right. Um, and I uh, going to a different podcast uh, from Behind the Bima. Uh, there's another one that's very popular that she has been on, and that's uh, Headlines Halacha Radio. So um, David Lichtenstein, who, who's, a, who's a friend and someone who's uh, I, I've listened to for years, and he's also a guest on our program in the past, he had the Rashiva on once, and I remember this is a few years ago. They were talking about Hashkafa and Yani Hashkafa, and the Rashiva said a line that I wonder if we could, if the Rashiva could elaborate on. And the, the Rashiva said that Hashkafa could also be Halacha. In other words, that we we seem to like make these two things into two different worlds. And I wanted to know if the Rashiva could share with our audience. I guess for starters, what's the definition of Hashkafa, and then how does it relate to Halacha? Absolutely, Rachel used to say a line, halacha tells you what you're obligated to do, what you're not permitted to do, and what you're permitted to do, not obligated. And hashkafa tells you what you're obligated to think, what you're not allowed to believe, and what you're permitted to believe. So hashkafa is also halacha, it's chavis al Instead of chavis al-vabas, the mitzvahs, you have to shake a lulav, and you're not allowed to eat chazer, and you're permitted to eat flesh, some milk, some supper, whatever you want. And Hashkafa is what you're obligated to believe, what you're not permitted to believe, and what and what's permissible to it's also Allah. It's also Allah. Absolvechik, when he gave the shear for the Balabatim, every week he would give a shear in New York for Balabatim on Tuesday nights in Maria. So uh, he used to spend more time on the Agarita than on the Halacha, and he would work very hard. And someone asked him, why does he spend so much time? So he said, if the Balabatim only understand the halacha, so they'll attribute it to the fact that it was above their heads. It was too difficult. If they won't understand the Agarata, they'll make fun of the Gemara. So he doesn't want them to make fun. So he used to spend an awful lot of time trying to explain what the Agarata is, what they're driving at. So he would quote, I don't remember him ever quoting anything from the Marambi Prague. Marag has, Maral has so much on Agarata. He used to always start with the Maharsha, the Chedush Agarata. So sometimes the Masha is a totally different way of thinking usually. But uh, once in a while, he would pick up an idea from the Masha and elaborate upon it. And then he would quote from the Mor Nebuchim, or from the Kuzari, or from the Chavis al He would always find um, beautiful interpretations of the Agaritas. And the students asked him, where did he develop, where did he pick up this derech in, in interpreting Agaritas? So he says, father taught him how to read in between the lines. He have to. He used to read in between the lines. He used to analyze the newspaper. In the newspaper, they would. I remember Rabbi Goldberg, Zohan Levracha, used to be the founding Rosh Hashiva in Karim Yavne, Used to visit America every year and meet with his former students, with his alumni. And then, if he would be in New York in the middle of the week, he would go visit by Rabbi Soloveitchik. So they would uh, usually they would talk and learning a little bit, and then they would talk a little bit about Israeli politics. So he said, Rabbi Goldberg said he was so surprised. Rabbi Salvechik was in Eretz Yisrael, 1935. He was a candidate for the Rabbanut in Tel Aviv. He, he didn't visit since then, but he would analyze the Israeli newspapers. He would read in between the lines. He would interpret why this Chava Knesset took his position, why the other one took that position. And therefore, and he said it was, it was uncanny. He understood. He never met these people. He understood what was behind each sheet in Israeli politics? That was unbelievable. Wow. 
I, I have to ask the Yeshiva a question on that. Once you mention the word politics, I have to, uh, Israeli politics, American politics, whatever, but I have to ask the Yeshiva a question. It, it, there seems to have been some sort of like um, move, I don't want to say movement, but uh, yeah, definitely a bigger focus amongst um, the, you know, the Orthodox community to be more focused on the, uh, on the current political climate, almost so much so that they believe that if you want to be a real Jew, you have to align yourself in this way and you have to support a candidate who's that way. And I'm not sure if the two should be mixed or not. Um, I want to know if the Rosh Hashiva has a, has a feeling of what, uh, now that we defined Hashkafa, but what, what is it, what should the relationship be, uh, be between um, Shomer Torah and Mitzvahs, uh, Yidin who are, who are keeping Torah and Mitzvahs and their, and their political, um, you know, preferences should there be um a focus on it or just no it's something you do in the ballot box and then you move on afterwards whom you vote for is a is a question of halacha you have to vote for the candidate we really should vote for the one who let's say in american politics we should really vote for the candidate who's best for the united states but we know that all the minority groups are not going to vote like that they're going to vote who's best for the blacks and who's best for the puerto ricans each group is going to vote who's best for them. So the Jews have to also vote who's best for the Jews, as opposed to voting for who's best for the United States. Who's best for the Jews? You have to investigate. You have to, you have to, in each, you can't always vote Democrat, you can't always vote Republican. It's not always going to be the same. You always have to determine who's best for the Jews in America, who's best for Israel, and so on. But, but if it wasn't for the fact that the minorities were putting themselves first, Jews should not put Jews first? In other words, that we shouldn't be first thinking what's best for Eretz Yisrael? Uh, we really, as American citizens, we should really vote for what's best for America. But uh, Lemaise, we can't because the other groups are voting for who's best for them. So we have to vote for who's best for us. We have no choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Soloveitchik used to say a line, someone printed this, that uh, politics is Kula Sheker. Everything in politics is sheker. So they asked him, so how come we call it politics? How come we don't call it sheker? So he said, if you would call it sheker, at least the title would be correct. Now <laughs> even the name, even the name is sheker. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Building off of that a little bit. Um, again, I don't want to paint too much of a doomsday uh, future, but um, as Rashiva mentioned, how complicated it is right now um, uh, to try to figure out and navigate the world that we live in. I'm curious, what do you think the problems that we're going to be facing in the next 20, 30, 40 years, both as American Jews and also as world Jewry and uh, as more and more Jews are in, and, end up in Eretz Israel? What, what do you envision being some of the big greatest challenges that we, we, we will face? All over the world, there's such a rebellion against Malchus Shamayim. There are only seven mitzvahs in the Nacht. The Gantz Zach is only seven mitzvahs. <clears throat> and they're fighting Eish uh, Shish we did away with. And uh, Mishkav Zacha we did away with already. And Gezel, uh, Gezel and Arias, everything we're doing away with. So, the, the chisel, these are the seven basic mitzvahs. The whole world is going crazy. That's going to be a major problem. The merit against Malchus Shamayim. Abortion, to, to outright the uh, outright the surim, benoach neregal ubrim, terrible. And then in Eretz Yisrael, there was from day number one, there was a big split between the religious Jews and the secular Jews. That's why Ben Gurion wanted to meet Ben Gurion asked who's the biggest rabbi, so they told him Ravel Vala Soloveitchik. So he sent one of his shamasim. He wanted to meet Ravel Vala, so Ravel Vala didn't didn't want to meet. So he said, nothing good will come out of it. Then he said, who's the second biggest rabbi? So he said, the Chazanish. So he, the Chazanish agreed to meet with him, and that was what the question that he posed him. He sees there's going to be such a split the Medina saw, between the secular Jews and the religious Jews. What should we do to prevent the Medina from ripping apart? So the Chazanish didn't give him an answer. He, gave, he spoke about other things that uh, Ben-Gurion would say over in the name of the Chazanish and so on, but that he didn't answer. And that's what's happening now. The whole Medina is about to rip apart between the religious and the secular Jews. That's going to be a big problem in Eretz Israel. Uh, the Rishu mentioned um, the, the, the problem of abortion, particularly for um, the non-Jewish world, that the non-Jews are judged for um, abortion. I was curious, 
Um, we actually had um, in my shul, we had one of your Talmidim, um, um, Rabbi Jeremy Weeder. It was probably about three, four months ago. And uh, Rabbi Weeder mentioned um, that um, how he, he was wondering what he would have to answer these types of questions for Jews. I was curious um, uh, where were Schechter falls on the, the abortion question for, for the Jewish community. I'm not sure if it's a, a public sock, if it's a private sock per situation. Um, I know there's the, the big debate between Rav Moshe um, and the Tzeliezer. So I'm not sure. I'm sure there she has his own view. Uh, I don't have my own view. No, if you look in the classical post, there are three opinions about abortion. There's a minority opinion that abortion is mutter. Then the sect opinion, abortion is only an isa de rabbanan. And the third opinion, the, 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 the most common opinion, abortion is an isa de raisa. So we assume really it's de raisa. Those who say that it's mutter, it's probably a mess. It's against, Taisus proves from the Gemara, mika midi. So if the benoich has chayv misa, so it all has to be awesome. So it's clearly an isa de raisa. The only big question is, before the Tzitzel, he has it. There's a tshuva by the Torah's Chesed. He has, Chelek Avanez, he has two tshuvas. Torah's Chesed was a rov in Lublin. And then when he retired, he moved to Eretz Yisrael and he joined the Badatz. So he has a, a major tshuva that the Tzitzel, he has, is based on. The Torah's Chesed has two tshuvas on this topic. What is the nature of the prohibition of abortion? Is it an Isa Chavola? It's like cutting off a finger. I have, if I have six fingers on my hand and I cut off one finger to look normal, that's permissible. If I have, let's say, a gangrene in the leg and they cut off a leg, they amputated to save my life. So that's, uh, that's muta. But if they cut off a, a finger for no good purpose, that's chavola. So is the iser, is the iser abortion an iser chavola? Or maybe I should say no. It's an iser itzicha, but you're not chayv misen. So that's a big question with the major nafkaminus Ladina. So the Tzitzali, so the, uh, what's the name? The Torah's Chesed. Uh, Rab Salvechik thought for sure that up until Mem Yom, first 40 days, he thought it's only an Isa Chavola. But Moshe doesn't even, doesn't even accept that. He thinks even with 440 days, it's an Isa Ritzich and it's only Mutter if the Vlad is a right of the mother, if the mother's life is besak on him. Rav Salvechik thought not so. He thought that before 40 days, it's Maya Bialma, it's not, it's not yet uh, even an Uber. <clears throat> it's not called a Leda. If it's before 40 days, he thought that's only an Isa Chavola. So that's the major question. When does it change? So the Torah's Chesed suggests maybe it changes only when she goes into labor. <clears throat> before she goes into labor, it's only an Isa Chavola. Or maybe it changes even before labor when she enters into the ninth month and the Vlad would be viable without a, a, an incubator. So that's his uh, Sophie. But he's he's the big makel. He's the big makel, on, um, and and uh, and there's room to be makel if you have a big shas track. If it's gonna if the if the doctors can tell that it's gonna be major problems with the baby, this can rip apart the marriage and can rip apart the, the whole family. Can destroy the whole shalom bias. If people have a sick child, I know students. I know people who got divorced. They couldn't. They couldn't take the agmas nefesh of having a sick child. It's terrible. <clears throat> so there's um, so there's really a serious room to be makel if if they know in advance. Um, if it's not yet the ninth month, there's really room to be makel to assume that it's only an isa chaval, even according to the Rambam. And whenever the chavol is l'tzorch tikan aguf, then there's no isa chavol. So here the chavol is to save the mother to save the mother from aggravation in the future. It really is a big room to be makel. Yeah. So but Moshe is very machman. This and Moshe thinks that even before forty days, everything is an isa ritzicha. The only time it's mutter is when the vlad the uber is putting the mother's life in sakana. He didn't write it. He's machman like the Rambam. Right, and and definitely the tzitz of the was a was a going oilam, um, and and Rashiva says that there's definitely room to be mingled. The question is, does a person, does the individual have a right to say, you know what, this is a real need? I'm a, I'll be simech on the tzitz of the azer. Until now, I didn't know anything about him. I didn't follow him, but now I need the heter. Does one is one allowed to just do that? 
It's not right to go around shop for coolers, but I remember uh, I once met a doctor from Rochester, New York, who was a Ben Torah. He had done his um, uh, interning in Eretz Israel for a couple of years there, and he became close to Reb Shlomo Zalman at that time. So there was a, an incident. There was a woman, I think she was a Gioris, and then took her a long time till she got a shidduch after she converted, then took her a long time till she became pregnant. And then she found out that she's pregnant with a sick child and it's going to be Agmas Nefesh, years full of Agmas Nefesh. So, uh, so the local rabbi from Rochester asked the doctor, could he please ask Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oybach on the telephone, is there room to be Mekel? The rabbi didn't have a relationship with Rabbi Shlomo Zalman, but the doctor did. So the doctor called up uh, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman and he asked him a shayla. So Rabbi Shlomo Zalman said, he told me over, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman says in Hebrew, you know my opinion, I hold that it's also, there's no room to be make them. So he tells him over, Chazaz over the story again. But till she converted, until she found a shidduch, until she became pregnant, everything came with such source, maybe there's room to be make. So he said, what is there room to be make? So he said, think it over, please, think it over overnight. I'll call you back tomorrow. So Rabbi Shlomo Zalman said, I don't know what there is to think of. Okay. He'll think it over overnight. He calls him back the next day. He says, Tagid li isha, she yesh poisik mefursam bi rushalayim, atzit saliyaz, he lo mechuyevich, she's not a Talmud on mine, she's not a chaser on mine. He's not mechuyev to follow me, tell her there's a major poisik in Eretz Yisrael, who says that it's mutta. You're not always mechuyev to follow, Rav Shalem Azalem is telling him this, you're not always mechuyev to follow uh, Rav Shalem Azalem. I remember once, uh, <clears throat> There was a, unfortunately, there was a Shabbaton with her boys and girls. One of the girls thought that she became pregnant over the Shabbaton. Turned out that she wasn't pregnant, just her period was delayed. So she thought that she was fooling around with one of the boys and she thought she became pregnant. She was single. So what's she going to do? So the, so the boy who, who, who thought that he was the one who made her pregnant, so he called up Rab David, he called up Rab David Feinstein and he asked him in the shah, so David Feinstein, he tells him, David Feinstein told him, whatever you do, don't ask my father. Ask someone else, <laughs> don't ask my father, because he knows what Rabbi Moshe is going to say. <laughs> Not everyone is mukhif to follow Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Not everyone will always mukhif to follow uh, Rabbi Shleim Zalman. Yeah. But but in both cases, it took Rav David to tell you not to go after Rav Moshe, and it took Rav Shlomo Zalman to tell you. Yet you are allowed to not follow Rav Shlomo Zalman. Correct. So even there, you need you need some okay. direction. Correct. Okay. Wow. Um, another contemporary um, halachic issue is the um, the balancing, I guess we could say, of public health versus mental health. Um, just earlier this week on our show, we released an episode with a world-renowned uh, mental health researcher, Dr. David Lieberman. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and uh, some of his research has uh, sold, the books have sold millions of copies. And he talked about that there is not a single community in the country, in the world, that didn't see a significant spike in abuse, opioids, drugs, addiction, divorce, every single violence in every single community throughout COVID. And which really begs the question, we have on one hand, um, the mitzvah, right? We don't find the word ma'oid that many times in the Torah by a mitzvah. It's, 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 it's very, um, uh, it's unique here to pikuach um, nefesh. On the other hand, um, we find that people who are in, who are very, uh, who are very, being very mentally challenged, that could, I guess, also um, have a, um, an, an effect on someone's health, not just mentally, but their, you know, physically. Um, I want to know if there's Shiva Kuwait in a little bit, where are the sources for mental health playing a role in halacha? And what are some of the um, guiding principles and how you weigh it in contrast to public health? Well, Moshe Feinstein assumes in his shuvas based on a comment that appears in Rashi and Masech Hastainis, Rashi Antinus, we assume, was not really written by Rashi, but whoever it is. So Rashi says that when a person is uh, mentally not all there, so there's a chashash that he may fall into the river and drown. He may not realize it. He, he may lose his life. So mental health itself, per se, is not considered pikoch nefesh. 
but because if he's not all there, he may lose his life. So that's Bikoch Nevesh. Rav Soloveitchik said the name of his grandfather, Rav Chaim, that just to restore one to, to normal uh, uh, mental health, that itself is Bikoch Nevesh, even if there's no chashash that he's going to fall in the lake or he's going to drown. So the Targum says, If a person speaks coherently, so that's uh, Nefesh Chaya. And if a person speaks incoherently, he doesn't have Ruach Memala, so that's um, that's Bechina uh, Pikuach Nefesh. Rabbi Kivega writes in his commentary on Shulchan Aruch that you're not allowed to have fleshiks in the nine days, but if a person had a, a lapse in his mental health and he has to eat healthy flesh in order to regain his his uh, his normal way of uh, thinking, so he's permitted, that's Bamak Mukhaila, he's permitted to eat flesh in the nine days. So Rab Salvechik said, a name Rab Chaim, not only allowed to have flesh in the nine days, he's permitted to eat on Tishabab, he's permitted to eat on Yom Kippur, permitted to eat on Tishabab, a Khalish Aim Basakana, he's permitted to eat on Yom Kippur, only Khalish Aish Basakana. But he said that Rab Chaim held that uh, to restore one to mental health is considered like Bikoch Nevesh, even if there's Nachashash, that he's going to lose his life. Yeah, we have dinim of different dinim of um, of shaita. Shaita doesn't have kiddushin. Even with the rabbanon, the gemara says a cherish. A retarded person is a cherish. Shaita is deranged. So minatora a cherish shaita be cotton. A retarded person, a deranged person, is a lab bardas, and he can't be mekadosh and isha. With the rabbanon, they instituted kiddushin cherish. Not only a cherish marries a cherish, a retarded boy marries a retarded girl. I, I attended a wedding that was a big wedding. Uh, NCSY has a Yachad program. So there was a big wedding. Hundreds of people attended the wedding a couple of years ago. A boy, a boy and a girl from Yachad got married together. So not only did they make Kiddushin de Rabbonon by a Cherish and marries a Chareshes, even a Cherish and marries a Pikachas or a Pikach and marries a Chareshes, they also made a Takon of Kiddushin de Rabbonon. Some men don't want to marry a wife who's too intelligent. They'd rather marry a retarded woman. And some uh, women would rather marry a retarded man. So there there's Kiddush and Rabbanon. By a shaita, there's no Kiddush and even with the Rabbanon. The Gemara says, because Edonim Dorim Nochash Bikfifa Achas, the marriage will simply not last. So they never made a takon of Kiddush and the Rabbanon by shaita or by shoto, by male or a female, one who is reta- uh, deranged. Because it doesn't make sense to make Kiddush, but Chevish Vachareshes is, is a lot bardas, Torah, but Midrabanan, they made the Takana Abishos. Yeah, the Gemara talks about different dinam of Chevish and Shaita, different alochas. And yeah. something that is becoming um, more, you know, people are more comfortable talking about the, um, the rise of challenges as it pertains to mental health. Even if we could say in back in the day with some of these things, if not exactly like the way they manifest themselves today, but they did exist in one way or another, there is no question there's a significant increase in um, with mental health problems, even as you know, starting with you know anxiety and depression, and then you know many uh, much more complicated issues. Um, my question is not so much from a um, clinical standpoint or psychological standpoint. Um, how do we under you know why that is, but maybe. Mitzad um, Hashkafa, um, Das Tairo, is, is Hashem t- trying to tell us something? Is there a message that we should, we should be that we should be getting? Why now? Why this thing in this part of history? What should our relationship be when we see this incredible rise of mental health challenges? I don't know. Interesting question. I never gave it any thought. I don't know. I, I was going to say uh, something besides Ikvesod de Meshicha, but maybe that's also uh, not a bad answer. I don't know. I <laughs> don't know. Never gave it any. I actually, I actually, I actually have a, a follow up a little bit on the on, on. I think I think there's there's so many questions about future things that we we don't know. Um, things like what Mashiach will exactly look like. I mean, now we have the Rambam Psakim about what Mashiach needs to do. We have Tchias um, Amesim, and we have Olam Haba. Um, a lot of these things are, are so hard for us to to fully wrap our head around. Um, I was curious about the, the, the following answer that sometimes when students ask me these questions, 
I, I suggest, I'm curious if it's a good answer, if it's a bad answer, if it's, if it's an answer I should be giving slightly differently. I often tell students that we'll find out when we get there, right? That I said the same thing that I tell my children when we, they ask me, did Bubby and Diddy make chocolate chip cookies? I say, I, I don't know, but we'll find out when we get there. So uh, is that a fair answer to these types of questions? Is, should, should, I, should I have more clarity on these things? That's what the Ramam himself says. We're not sure whether really or not he's going to come before Mashiach or after Mashiach. He says, we'll find out there are different opinions in the Gemara itself. He says, we'll find out when we get there. That's what the Ramam writes. Yeah, we don't know. We just know generally vague. There's going to be a Leo or not he's going to be Mashiach, but we're not sure what's going to, what the order of the issues are going to be. So I guess building off it a little bit, there are also areas of Halacha where sometimes brain death right so we struggle to understand how these things really work fundamentally we, we we're, we're lacking full but sometimes you have people big hush of rabbanim who are they seem to be so they they like it's 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 emerson and Shecker. like they know for sure that their view on a certain issue that's so hard to really understand with what we have right now like how do we approach areas? I, th- I think it's sort of similar. It's not exactly the same, right? Because it's something that we're dealing with right now. But is it is to not have clarity? Is that a, a fair um, a fair approach to some of these big questions? I think sure, sure, it's a fair approach. We don't have, we don't know enough. The Gemara doesn't have enough information that we should have a clear cut psak on, on many of these issues. Everything has to be based on, on the Gemara. We can't make up things on our own. And the Gemara is very unclear on a lot of things. Do you think it's fair that sometimes people come across as, as very certain about these types of topics? Because I feel like, especially when they're, the, the, the ramifications are so large, I feel like people come across so strong about one side or the other. Yeah, how can they be so certain? Yeah, it's very surprising, sure. Thank you. Can the Rashiva give us a bracha, a parting uh, bracha for, for the city of Columbus? The Kailo should be Matzliach to have an influence on the whole city. It should have a hashpo on, on the whole Jewish community and the whole world. Thank you so much. And I hope that maybe one day we'll be able to welcome and, and uh, bring the Rashiva to our community, to, to the shul, to the school, to the Kailo, to the, to the, to, to the entire shtat uh, to see um, to see to see Torah and Godless Patayra. Thank you so much for joining us. Very good. David Amelech, King David, relates to us in Tehillim Kuf Yud Tet, Psalms 119, a beautiful description of, of our relationship with Torah. He says, beginning with the famous words, Lulei Toratcha, Shashui, Az Avadati Be'ani. Had your Torah not been my preoccupation, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for through them you have preserved me. We would like to now share with you a, mu- a beautiful music video presentation entitled Lule Sarascha, composed by A.D. Rotenberg of Journey. He sits late at night in the soft candlelight as it casts its warm glow on the pages. And the words that he sees are the secret, the key that has kept us alive through the ages. Why does he cherish the wisdom of old and delight in its study each day? He knows only Torah can nourish his soul. Come listen. And hear what he said. without you, I surely would die. must you've given my spirit to me. 
Tayr is our joy, and this is why we're all here today. Tayr is the lifeblood of the Jewish people. And sit here, and be here for the sake of Torah. That itself is one of the most amazing things in life. As a nation in flight, we endured the world's spite, and the sight of our precious books burning. Disbelief and never, no, never stop learning. Why does he cherish the wisdom? Without you, I surely would die. Seven states just today reporting their first cases of the coronavirus. New York City schools are shut for five weeks. Cities from New York to Los Angeles are shutting down schools, restaurants, and large gatherings to stop the spread. For the isolation, home isolation of all of those 65 years and older and those with chronic conditions. While the world was in confusion and everything started to close, the Kolo students never stopped learning be it chavrusas, classes, public school groups, young professional learning, all of us demonstrated that life without Torah is no life at all. No one could stop us from our Torah learning. And now we remain with our faith yet sustained by our passion and love for this treasure. It's our link with Sinai and our Father on high. So we'll keep on learning forever, 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 forever. To listen to all Kolo's episodes and see upcoming guests, visit kolopodcast.com. We are also on all podcast players. Type in Kolo on iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean, and Amazon. Share with your friends and please make sure to give us a five-star review. Kolo is a project of the Columbus Community Kolo, a full-time Jewish learning center in Bexley, staffed with high-caliber Torah scholars. 
ever since 1995. Boys, girls, men and women from all backgrounds and affiliations have found many opportunities to connect with Torah and mitzvot at the Kolo. Whether it's a study partner, engaging lesson, or a program, the Kolo is your one-stop shop for all your Jewish learning. If you want to know how you can benefit from the Kolo, visit thekolo.org. That is T H E K O L L E L dot org and forever be inspired.